let's open our Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4, fourth chapter in the book of Ephesians. And uh, again, as a reminder, as we make our way through these final three chapters, the Apostle Paul is laying out for us what is to be our response to the great grace and the great love of God. The last time we were together, Paul talked about how that essentially were to change our wardrobe, not the literal clothes we wear, of course, but, but the spiritual clothes, if you will, the, the attitude of life, the, the attitude that we, that we carry around with us. There are things that are associated with our former manner of living, our, our life before Christ that have to go, that we have to, Paul says, put off. And then there are things that are associated with life in Christ that we are to put on, to put upon us. Now, the last time we were together, Paul finished here in Ephesians 4 verse 24 by telling us that we're to put on the new man or the new self created after the likeness of God in righteousness and holiness. Now, when Paul says put on the new man, well, what does that look like? Right? I mean, what, what in the world does that mean, put on the new man? Well, thankfully now, Paul doesn't leave us in the dark, because beginning in verse 25, and for the next chapter and a half or so, Paul's going to get very specific here, and he's going to tell us what does it mean, what does it look like to put on the new man. Now, I think a real byproduct here, I think that a, uh, uh, one of the real values of the next three chapters is that it's really going to show us, guys, what bugs God, okay? It's going to show us what's important to God. And I think because of the the pride of life, right, that we just somehow assume that the convictions that we hold to personally are somehow convictions that have come to us from on high, right? I mean, and because of that, well, well, our convictions are, well, they must be God's convictions, And so we're busy running around the church playing little holy spirits, right? And we're telling everybody, well, don't do this and don't touch that. And and what's interesting as we get through this, guys, you're going to discover in the weeks ahead, you're not going to see anything about hairstyles or dancing or movies or tattoos and these kinds of things, right? There's none of that stuff here, but he deals with the attitudes of the heart and how these attitudes will manifest themselves. If the attitudes of our heart are in line with the mind of God, then the lifestyle that is pleasing to God is going to be forthcoming. All right, so as we dig in then uh, tonight, right out of the blocks, I'm fascinated by what Paul mentions here in verse 25. Let's look at verse 25. Therefore, laying aside lying, you might have falsehood there, laying aside falsehood, speak truth, each one of you, with his neighbor, for we are, and here's the reason, Paul says we're to speak truth, members of one another. All right? Well, lying, lying can take a number of forms, can it not? I mean, you've got dishonesty, You've got cheating, you've got fudging on your income tax return, right? You have false flattery, exaggerating, embellishing something. I mean, we've we've become so accustomed to what we, we would call just normal or acceptable forms of lying. You know, somebody comes up to you that you haven't seen in a while seen in a while, and you're just trying to be nice. Right, I mean, but before you before you know it, out of your mouth shoots the automatic. Well, hey, you look good. It's been a while, and yet in reality, maybe the person looks like they were on the losing end of a swamp fight or whatever. You know, whatever that is. But and, and so we're lying, but but it's okay because we're trying to be nice, right? Now we have grown so accustomed to lying that we just sort of assume everybody lies. I mean, all salesmen lie. All contractors lie, for crying out loud, right? All politicians lie, and, and so everybody lies. And, you know, and so we've so lowered the bar in our culture on this deal, and, and even in the church, even in the church, there's that assumption where, where we think that there are times when it's okay to lie. I, again, I remember an experience back in Indianapolis when I first came to the Lord. You know, again, we'll say, oh, well, you look great. No, you don't. 
<laughs> yeah, there's this guy I ran into. I remember I could, I remember thinking that I could use his bathwater to kill weeds, but you know that wouldn't be the Christian thing to say. So you know, oh no, looking good, bro. You know, and so th- that's just what we do. We're trying to be nice, and then there's the infamous, hey, can you get involved in this deal over here? And we say, ah, uh, yeah. Tell you what, let me pray about that. Right? Have you ever heard that one? And so now we're cloaking our unwillingness in spiritual garb, right? And so we've really lowered the bar. We've somehow come to accept a certain degree of lying in our culture. I mean, hey, everybody's doing it. Now, it might not bug us, but it bugs God. Okay? And I want you to appreciate the depths of why Lying bugs God. You go all the way back to the Garden of Eden in the book of Genesis, right? And, and, and what do you find there but Satan lying to the progenitors of the human race, Adam and Eve, right? Lament over this particular sin, lying. Lament over lying has very deep roots in the heart of God. The Bible tells us that, John eight forty four. Satan is a liar, that he is the father of lies. What was the very first thing, the very first recorded words of the devil in the Bible? Has God really said you can't eat from the tree? Has God really said? You see, the very first recorded words of the enemy in the word of God were in fact questioning the word of God. So Eve responds, well, yeah, that's what God said. We eat of that tree over there and we will die. And then the second recorded words of the devil in the Bible were a lie. He said, surely you will not die. And so the father of lies, in fathering that very first lie, brought forth the immensity of the sin problem in the first place. Very deep roots in the heart of your heavenly father. In fact, Proverbs chapter 6 Solomon lists six, nay, seven, right? Solomon talks about seven things that God hates. Go check it out later. Lying is in there twice, okay? I think there's a point there. So lying, pretty big deal to God. Now we see this in the New Testament as well. In the book of Acts, here you've got the early church. What do you suppose the very first sin that was judged in the early church was? Lying, okay, I mean, you had like a 90% chance of nailing that one contextually, right? Okay, you guys are on it tonight. Uh, We're just going to have to stop making decaf available. Um, So yeah, the very first sin that was judged in the early church was lying, that whole Ananias and Sapphira deal, Acts chapter 5. So very deep-rooted hatred for lying in the heart of your heavenly Father, and so it should be no shocker that the very first part of putting on the new man is putting away lying. Now, listen, guys, because this is the deal practically for you and me. Are we going to hell for lying? No, we are not. That sin, along with every other sin you've ever committed, are committing, and will commit in the future. That has already been atoned for, paid for, in full, by the, by the blood of Christ on the cross. However, know this. Whenever we are lying, the spirit of Satan goes to work in our lives, and we are breaking fellowship with God. Okay? Whenever we are lying, the spirit of Satan goes to work in our lives and we are breaking fellowship with the Lord. Whenever we're speaking the truth, it is the spirit of God that is released into our lives and and what we're doing is cultivating and developing, maintaining that fellowship with God. So the question we need to be asking ourselves is, yes, I'm saved, praise God on that deal, but now whose spirit do I want to be working within and around my life? And if we want that spirit to be the spirit of the living God at work, then we must be walking in truth. And if we desire that unbroken fellowship with the Lord, then we must be walking in truth. Are these sins atoned for at the cross? Yes, they are. Are are they going to keep us out of heaven? No, they are not. But you know what they will do? Break your fellowship with God for a period of time. Who wants that? Okay? So whose spirit do we want working in our lives If we want that to be the spirit of God and not the spirit of the enemy, then we need to be walking in truth. So the first thing that God mentions in describing 
putting on the new man is quit lying. Okay, Paul's saying, knock it off, guys. That's the first part of putting on the new man. Now, again, I told you, notice the reason that Paul gives here. And, and again, couch this in the context of unity that Paul has brought forth here in chapter 4. The reason Paul gives here is because we are members of one another. Again, we find Paul using the imagery of the body as he so often does. The idea is this. Your body is not going to be healthy if it does not, what? Speak the truth within itself. If I put my hand on a hot burner and my nerve endings are telling my brain it's not hot, guess what? I'm going to burn my hand. If my eyes are saying the road in front of you is as straight as an arrow, when in reality there's a sharp 90 degree turn right there, I'm going to crash and burn. If your individual members start lying to the rest of the members of your body, your body is going to be in a weakened or a damaged state. Paul is saying this is the case within the church, the body of Christ. If we as members of the same body begin to bring forth lies to one another, what we are doing is damaging the body of Christ. If your, if your local assembly, wherever you fellowship, if that is to be a healthy local assembly, then the truth must be spoken. So number one, we need to strip ourselves of lying because when we are lying, we subscribe to and operate in the realm of evil. When we are lying, we subscribe to and operate in the realm of evil. All right? When we are speaking the truth, we are walking within the will of God. And when we do that, when we're walking in truth, we will see the presence of God and the power of God manifesting himself in our lives, in, in, in our local assemblies. All right. So number two here, picking it up in verse 26. Now, sort of a double-edged sword here. Read the first part of this verse, particularly the first two words. Read the first part of this very carefully. This might surprise you. Q verse 26. Be angry. What? Did I read that right? Be angry and yet do not sin. And then the part of the verse we all know and love. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. And do not give the devil an opportunity. So not dealing with anger, verse 27, gives the devil an opportunity. So we are to take off lying. But then he says, be angry. It's a commandment. Be angry. Arr, what in the world's going on here, right? Now, anger is, what is anger? A anger is simply an emotional arousal brought forth by something that displeases us, right? That's what anger is. Anger in itself, guys, is not sin. You go back to the Old Testament, you'll find the phrase, the anger of the Lord, more than a few times, right? As a matter of fact, you'll find that phrase around a hundred times in the Old Testament. New Testament, well, you've got John the Baptist, kind of an angry guy, right? Pretty intense individual. I mean, he said to the Pharisees, you family of snakes, who told you of the wrath to come? I mean, now, that's not a very nice thing to say, John, but, but he was angry. New Testament. And of course, Christ himself. You remember he got pretty torqued off when he went through the temple and made a whip, right? I mean, here, sweet, innocent Jesus, and he makes a whip. And it wasn't for a sermon illustration, all right? I mean, he was angry turning over the money changers table with a whip that he had to take some time to make because religious people were putting up barriers, financial barriers, between the common ordinary person worshiping God. Now, the real litmus test, friends, for whether or not anger is a sin is what is it directed towards, okay? Is it righteous indignation against some sin? Or is it indignation over self? That's the key right there, guys. Is the anger directed at sin or is the anger directed at self? In other words, are my feelings hurt? Did I, did I not get my way? 
you know, was, was I ignored somehow? And having said that, I would suggest to you that it is fairly difficult for you and I to practice a righteous anger because we have emotions that are tainted by sin, right? Where gods are not. We don't have the same perfect knowledge that God has in all matters. So righteous anger can get a bit tricky for us. But there's nothing wrong with a righteous anger directed at sin alone. As a matter of simple fact, most of the positive changes that have happened in society have, have happened because somebody got angry. Finally, right? Somebody finally got angry and did something about slavery. We have Megan's Law in, in most of our states because somebody up in New Jersey finally got angry with sexual predators doing very bad things to children. Now, where we get ourselves in trouble and what Paul is saying is to be stripped off of us is when our anger, that maybe even starts out as a righteous anger, but when our anger really becomes a selfish anger. Now, selfish anger is what you see in domestic abuse. Right? Selfish anger is what you see at the Little League game when one parent starts cussing like a drunken sailor to another parent or beats the other parent up. That's selfish anger. We live in an age of rage. You don't believe that? Jump out on the highway during rush hour, right? I mean, some of us by nature, some of us by nature can be just very angry people and, and maybe we've even tried to calm ourselves. Maybe we've tried to manage our anger, and, and we know that from time to time our anger, while we can try and manage it, we know that, that from time to time our anger can move us to that place where we sin. And so the $64,000 question is, how do we overcome selfish anger? How do we keep our anger and our emotions within the realm of righteousness? Well, Paul tells us here, Right here, there are two things that we have to do. What does he tell us? Number one, he says, be angry, but don't sin. Now tune in here. When I'm pulled, listen, when I'm pulled into selfish anger, I have to be willing to admit, look, this is sin. Now too frequently what we say is, well, well, it's just a weakness, you know, that's what it is. It's a weakness, and, and it's just a weak area in my life. No, quit calling it that. God calls it sin, and we have to call it exactly what it is. It's interesting to me how our culture has come up with all these clinical terms to sanitize our sinful behavior, right? Oh, well, your son just struggles with, with ODD. That's oppositional defiance disorder, and, and, and I think we can work with this. Here's a little pill. It's not oppositional defiance disorder. Quit sanitizing it. It's called rebellion. Okay? Now, you don't find this in the scriptures, right? When Israel wanted to go back into Egypt after all that murmuring in the wilderness, God did not say, well, I understand. You got a little separation anxiety here. And I think you've got some security issues. You know, let's, you know, that's not what he said. You rebels, he said, you're, that you're in sin and I'm going to judge you because of your sin. Numbers 14. Listen, if I say, the moment I say, if I say something is a weakness, well, then there's a degree of acceptance there. And I'm patting that sin on the back, right? And you know, it's okay. And, and if I do that, there's a certain way that I go about approaching it, Right? But if I am willing to call it what it is, if I am willing to call it sin, well, then I'm going to approach it very differently. I'm going to look for the source, and I'm going to prayerfully address this before the Lord. Lord, Lord, you know what? Man, this is sin. Could you help me? Can I get your grace and your mercy here? And the Lord will meet you right there, man. He'll meet you right there, and he'll begin to go to work. All right. So if you want to overcome anger, you have to call it what it is. It is sin. That's number one. Number two, notice that Paul says, do not let the sun go down on your anger. The second way that we overcome anger is an issue of timeliness. You have to immediately address every episode of anger. You got to immediately go to God, repent, I'm sorry, Forgive me, Lord, I can't believe I did this yet once again. 
And then you've got to go to the person that you harmed and you need to ask them to forgive you as well. And you do not rest until you have done that. And you do that because if you don't do that, if you don't deal with it, in the, number one, if you don't call it sin, and number two, if you don't address that in a timely manner, you got verse 27, you've given an opportunity to the devil. All right? In other words, if you don't deal with selfish anger in a timely fashion, you just tuck that sucker away for a rainy day, that's exactly what's going to happen. You're going to get that rainy day, all right? It's going to fester, it's going to boil, you know, the devil's got a foothold there, and then a real resentment and a real bitterness is going to be right around the corner, it's going to snowball. Pastors see this in counseling, okay? Those married couples that are in the most trouble are those couples that have been angry since 2003, I mean, there was an offense. Something had happened, and, and they went to sleep. They went to bed and just covered it up. And something else happened, and something else happened. They threw that on the pile, and after 10 years, they've got this mountain of anger and resentment. Now, here's a barometer. Let's get practical. Here's a metric for you. The way that you can tell that you have not dealt with anger in a timely manner is that you're torqued off about everything. All the time. You're just mad at everything. There's a real clue that over the course of your life, you have not dealt with anger in a timely fashion. You've tucked it away, it's built up, you've got this mountain, and you're mad at the world, all right? Now, the word of God is saying, the word of God is saying, if you want to get over the hump, if you want God to be giving you victory over the selfish anger, number one, you got to call it what it is. It is sin, and then you have to deal with it in a timely fashion. So you put off lying, and you put off selfish anger. And then he says in verse 28, verse 28, he who steals must steal no longer. Now, notice what Paul links this to. Interesting. Notice what he links stealing to here. He says, he who steals must steal no longer, but rather, linkage, he must labor, performing with his own hands what is good, so that he will have a bigger car and a bigger house. I left my glasses back in the office. But he who, he, he who steals must steal no longer, then he links it to labor, performing with his own hands what is good so that he will have something to share with the one who is in need. Underline that word need. It means desperate, all right? We'll get to that in a minute. Now, stealing in Paul's day, just like stealing today, if it's not nailed down, somebody's going to take it. And I think like lying, there's an element of this that we've come to accept in our culture. Who knows the cartoon Dora the Explorer? Anybody? A show of hands. Okay, well, you know, it's interesting. It's, it's plugged into our kids from childhood. My two-year-old daughter, Zoe, loved, well, she's not getting it anymore, but she used to love this Dora the Explorer cartoon. You know, every single episode, without exception, there's a character called Swiper the Fox, okay? And all this little dude, all the little dude does, episode after episode, is lurk behind the bushes, waiting to jump out and steal something. Dora then solicits the kids interactively to help her say, Swiper, no swiping! Swiper, no swiping! And then the little dude goes, Oh, man! And then he just snaps his finger and comes around the bushes ten minutes later. You know, it's just a recurring character. But again, I mean, it's, it's, we're so inundated with, with the acceptable nature of this. Like lying, stealing takes many forms and has a, a very commonplace acceptance in our culture. Not giving your employer a full day's work for a full day's wage, you're stealing from them, are you not? Well, you're on Facebook half the day. You know, if they're not paying you, for, if they're paying you for eight hours of work and you're only putting in five or six, what are you doing? You're stealing from them. There was a forensic accounting firm by the name of Kessler's. I read this last week. They did a study on employee theft, and they found that 79, 79% of employers, uh, employees steal from their employer. 79%. Whether they're tucking CDs or office supplies in their purse or whatever, bathroom supplies, falsifying timesheets, walking off with inventory, hanging out on social media sites, whatever. 
uh, the Kessler firm told us, uh, they tell us that, that employee theft is costing American businesses over $120 billion a year. They tell us that one out of every three employees steals to some degree. And they tell us that employee theft, and they tell us that employees themselves steal more than shoplifters. Okay? Look at the way we use sick days, right? I mean, I'm just going to call in sick. Are you sick? No. But you know, I only got three sick days left, and if I don't use them before the end of the year, I'm going to lose them. I mean, they're sick days, all right? And now, under that scenario, not only are you robbing your employer of your productivity, but you're lying on top of it, double whammy. Now you're going for double jeopardy there, right? And so like lying, we have become accustomed to steal at just the drop of a hat. Again, while it doesn't seem to bug us, it bugs God. Paul is saying, knock it off. That's part of putting on the new man. Now, again, Paul doesn't leave it at that. But here, as I said, interestingly, he's now linking stealing with work. So don't steal, get a job seems to be kind of the message there. Now, the Bible, of course, emphasizes uh, in a weighty way the, the value and the importance of hard work. Throughout the book of Proverbs, we discover that God honors hard work, that if you'll work hard, God will, will prosper and God will bless your life. One of the greatest things you can teach your kids, value of, of hard work. But notice how radical Christianity is here, guys. Notice how the New Testament is really raising the bar here. He's not saying work hard so you can have a nice car or a nice house or whatever. But notice he says here, work hard in order that you might give to others. Right? Work hard, be diligent, be faithful in your work. So it then positions you... To be, in, to be in a place of ministry that you can be a blessing to others. Okay? Now, finally here, I had you underline that word need. Very last word in verse, 20, uh, verse uh, 28. Very last ver word. Or you might have needeth in the King James, right? Now, that Greek word for need, it means, again, somebody that is in desperate straits, dire straits. So listen, because this might be freeing for some of you, this might free you. We are not to work hard in order to subsidize laziness. Okay? Some guy in a healthy body shows up, wants money. You are under no obligation biblically to support that person. Sarah and I were on our way to, to look at cars a, a, month or, a month or so ago after I almost died. And we get to this off-ramp coming off the highway, and there's this, you know, we get off the ramp, and, and there's this absolutely healthy-looking guy. In fact, he's got a pretty good tan going, you know, nice clothes, well-kept, combed hair, new gym shoes, and, and he's holding this sign, you know, please help God bless or something, you know. These guys aren't dumb. They know how to get the God bless in there, right? And I'm thinking, dude, what a racket you got going on here, man. Get a job. We have almost 8% unemployment. It's, it's almost at historic highs if you throw out the, the post-Great Depression decade in the 30s. And the church is not to subsidize any kind of freeloading. If you want to give the guy on the, the side of the road money, I mean, go for it, I suppose. I'm not trying to discourage charity here. That's not the point. But I don't want you to feel guilty about it. Okay. There are those that are seeking to pray upon you, not pray for you, pray upon you. And the word of God says nothing about subsidizing laziness. In fact, Paul said to Timothy, look, if a woman is a widow, if she's over 60 years old, if she has no family to support her, and if she has been faithful in the fellowship, he's laying out all these criteria, that is the kind of person that should get financial assistance from the church. Okay, and you got James and he throws uh, uh, the orphans in there as well. So, uh, this word need here, it's talking about somebody in desperate shape. While we're not to subsidize the lady, we are to give to those who are, are, are desperate in need. And you know what? If you can't find somebody around you within your sphere of influence that is in desperate shape, I about guarantee you, you don't have to look too far and hard outside that circle to find somebody in desperate need. They're everywhere. 
At the end of the day, guys, God wants you to work hard so that he can bless your life, not so that you can have more or bigger stuff, but so that he might use you in ministry. And the giving to others, that's part of putting on the new man. All right, well, I'm picking it up in verse 29. Paul now begins to introduce this issue of speech, which we'll tackle in greater detail in verse 4 next week. But let's look at verse 29. Let no unwholesome word, or, or you might have corrupt speech, let no corrupt speech proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification, that means building up, according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. Well, Jesus tells us in Matthew, you know the verse, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, right? And I think, I think it's really pretty easy. I think it's pretty easy to determine if a person is an authentic Christian, not just in name only, but, but you know, an authentic born-again believer. I think it's pretty easy to tell by simply engaging in conversation with them over a period of time. Now, even in this day of social media, I, I've, I've been, as, uh, in the last year or so, in a couple of situations where I've been asked to deal with a person that I don't know, okay, and, and you know, the first thing, out, my starting point is always, well, are they saved? You know, do they know the Lord? I, you know, what's the story? And, and, you know, the person will say, well, I, I really don't know. Now, I'm telling you, only God knows the heart, of course, but I, I'm telling you, I can go to their Facebook page and read all their posts and give you a fairly strong guess as to whether or not the Spirit of God is dwelling within that person. Point is this, guys. Our speech and our manner of speaking are very telling. Okay? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so, man, we need to be very careful out there. And, and, and I, I am submitting to you, I am suggesting that, that you can always tell which kingdom a person is from the kingdom of death and darkness, or the kingdom of light and life. If somebody is from the language, the language of the kingdom of death and darkness is complaining, fault-finding, cynicism, blaming stuff on the other person. That's the language of death and darkness, all right? The language of the kingdom of light and life is gracious and kind with forgiveness and hope and thanksgiving. Let us represent the kingdom of God well. Our language, is, our, our, what we say is very telling. Now, when we were kids, we would say, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me, right? But that's not exactly true, is it? The words that we speak and the words that we hear, they do bring harm. Paul here is saying we need to put off corrupt speech. We need to put that off. It needs to be stripped away. This Greek word uh, here, guys, for corrupt or unwholesome, it means in the Greek, rotten fruit. All right? This word in, in the Greek, uh, uh, um, the Greek diction literally means that which is worthless, bad, or rotten. Now, how much trouble has come into our lives because of something stupid that's come out of our mouth? I think we can all identify with that one, right? We are to speak in such a way that is building up people. It was said of Job. It was said of Job that when he spoke, he kept men on their feet, that his speech was like a fresh spring rain to his hearers, Job 29. And that's how our word should be. Listen, when people get done speaking with you, are they filled with hope? Are they charged up? Are they ready to aggressively tackle the issues of life? Or, when people get done speaking with you, do they want to go and shoot themselves in the face? Right? I mean, what kind of an effect are you having on people? I mean, Paul tells the Colossians, let your... I wasn't even trying to be funny with that. Paul tells the Colossians, let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt. If you are putting the new man on, there is going to be a building up and edifying coming forth from your speech. And, and by the way, if you really want to get a hold of this Bible students, check out James chapter 3. All right? And again, we'll talk more. This is the general assertion. We'll talk more specifically in verse 4 uh, next week. It's going to be awesome. All right. So verse 30 then, 
Ephesians 4.30, a famous memory verse for me, fascinating verse. Let's look at that. Do not grieve, underline grieve. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. This word grieve in the Greek, I'll give you the definition in a second, but I want you to understand something. This word grieve is associated with love. Okay? You can't grieve somebody who doesn't love you. All right? I mean, you can make them mad, you can make them angry, but you cannot grieve them because this word speaks of of relationship. When a child does not follow the wise counsel of a parent, that grieves the parent because of the love that is there and the relationship that is there. Okay? Now, this word grieve means in the Greek to harm by distress. To harm by distress. It speaks of a hurt. Now, think about what Paul is saying here, man. Think about this. Here is the third person of the Holy Trinity, and he is telling us that as he is living within us, as he's watching us lie, watching us steal, watching us tear down people, watching us rip off our employer, as he sees all of this garbage going on in our lives, the effect is it hurts him. Here's the fascinating part. Here is this God who spoke these vast star systems into existence by his word alone, and now we are being told that you and I have the capacity to hurt this God, to bring harm to his heart. Why? Because of his great, great love for us, you see. Because there's a relationship that's supposed to be there. There's supposed to be intimacy there. Okay? What a stunning thing that the living God of the universe, the creator, the brilliant creator of, of all that we see and unsee, that we have the capacity to hurt him, to harm him by distress. That's fascinating. And it ought to move us to not do these things that he's asking us to strip off, not because we're being religious and we got to keep a set of rules or earn our way to heaven. All this works-based theology is a bunch of garbage. It's another Bible study. But we ought to put these things off because we don't want to hurt him. Okay? Let's get that straight. Now, this verse also tells us what? That God is, in fact, a person. That the Holy Spirit, whom, you know, the Gnostics and and various forms of false teaching over the years have tried to, to call the Holy Spirit some impersonal force, and, you know, some... No, the Holy Spirit is a person. You can grieve him. You cannot grieve. You cannot hurt some impersonal force. All right? This is a person that we're talking about. Okay, finally then tonight, Paul's going to sum it all up for us in these last two verses... Uh, Verse 31, let all bitterness, and and all of this we've talked about, here he pulls it together, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Here's what you got to put on now, verse 32, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, underline, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ has also forgiven you. Forgiven is in there twice, we better look at that. But again, Back to verse 31, bitterness, that's a long-standing resentment. It's the result of not dealing with anger in a timely fashion, right? And wrath, uh, this, this Greek word for wrath is, is like a grass fire. It, it speaks of something that just explodes but, but just as quickly dies down. You know, sometimes a person will justify their behavior by saying, well, you know, I just explode, all right, but you know, then it's all over with. Well, so does a shotgun, right? I mean, but there's damage that's been done. And then again, he says, and and, and clamor and evil evil speaking and malice, uh, these things need to be put away. Uh, Verse 32, this is what you put on. Now, a couple of things here. Again, um, we'll get to forgiven in a minute, but look at the very first two words in verse 32. Underline them, be kind. This Greek word for kind is not what it comes into in the English, okay? Okay. This word for kind, it doesn't mean pat him on the head, tell him to, 
you know, take a couple of aspirin and call you in the morning, right? This Greek word, it's very strong. It is an action. It means that you are aggressively pursuing ways that you might be a blessing to other people, okay? You're, it's an action. Now, the second thing here, I had you underline, forgive twice, be tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even, if God, even as God in Christ has forgiven you. So we've got to deal with that. It's there twice. Now, it is God's expectation, is it not, that you are going to sin on a daily basis? I mean, do we honestly believe that when God sees us sin, that he is surprised? <gasps> John sinned this morning. No. I mean, do you think that he sits on yonder throne, turns to Gabriel and says, you know, if I were a betting God, I would have bet they would have made it through the whole day without sinning. I am surprised. I am shocked. I really thought they were going to pull it off today. You remember the disciples came to Jesus and they said, would you teach us to pray? And then in what we call the Lord's Prayer, he gave them an outline to follow that on a daily basis, remember that? Jesus said, give us this day our daily bread. And to our point here, he also said what? Spoken every day, daily, right? Forgive us our sins as we forgive others. I think one of the things that really bugs God, and it should be obvious, but let's unpack it. One of the things that really bugs God is an unforgiving spirit. Because here we are, we come to him, we accept his forgiveness. Oh, I'm sorry, never do it again. Thank you, God. And, and we go off in our forgiven state, and yet we are unwilling to forgive other people. That bugs God. Now, you remember Peter came to Jesus, and he said, well, how many times do I need to do that? Like seven? But we don't really get that. You see, the rabbis in Peter's day taught that, that you only had to forgive twice. And the third time you are out. So they were the original three strikes and you're out guys, right? Now, I'm sure, given what we know about Peter, that Peter thought he was being like seven. <laughs> you know, I'm sure that Peter thought he was being very benevolent. You know, it, you know he was just, oh, you know, I'm sure he was waiting for Jesus to say, Peter, wow, seven? I've never seen a heart that big before. Jesus did not say that. He said 70 times seven. Peter gets out his abacus. You mean I'm done at 490? No, you know, the number seven, again, speaks to the completeness in Scripture. So the idea there is we are to forgive completely. Now, here's what I want you to get. Here's the takeaway. I, I want you to understand that when you choose not to forgive, it's not the other person that's damaged by your unforgiveness. It's actually you. I mean, they don't even care. I, you, you are the one damaged by your decision not to forgive. It's not the other person. Thomas Chalmers said, and is now oft repeated, quote, unforgiveness is the poison we drink, hoping another will die. We think we're somehow damaging them by not forgiving them, but the reality is we're damaging ourselves, and we are doing that because we are in withholding that forgiveness, we are walking in direct opposition to the throbbing heartbeat of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Right? What is the heartbeat of the gospel? Our sins have been forgiven. I tell you what, man, there is great freedom in forgiveness. Because when you do that, you are walking in and operating from the very heart of the core of the gospel. And guys, that can be a powerful experience for you. Plug into that. It's the heart of the gospel. It's what Christ did for us. Definitely part of putting on the new man. Now, in closing, guys, I, I think all of this boils down to simple trust and obedience. All right? It boils down to trust and obedience. Why do we lie? Because I don't trust God. I want people to think better of me. My, my, my identity, my validity is sought in other people rather than, than myself. Or, or, or I lie to keep myself out of trouble. 
And if I lie to keep myself out of trouble, I should be trusting God to teach me when I do something wrong. Why do we steal? Not trusting that the Lord will provide for us, right? Again, it's an insecurity. Why do we get angry? Because we don't trust that God will defend us. We lie because we don't trust God will teach us. We steal because we don't trust that God will provide for us, all right? And we get angry because we don't trust the Lord will defend us. Like we don't believe that God will deal with the evildoers in our lives. It is all an issue of trust. If we will trust God, then we will not lie, we will not steal, we will be open to being a blessing to others, and we're not going to become a victim of bitterness or or unforgiveness and anger. In short, if we trust the Lord, we will bring forth obedience. Obedience, guys, is the most valuable currency in the kingdom of heaven, all right? Obedience is where the rubber hits the road in the word of God. Obedience, friends, tune in. It is the pathway to peace, all right? Let me say that again. Obedience is the pathway to peace. Alistair Begg, one of my favorite teachers, got the pleasure of of meeting him at the Gospel Coalition this year. He said, intellect is not the key to learning Christian doctrine. Obedience is the key to learning Christian doctrine. And there's some real weight to that. You don't learn of Christ by simply assenting to something in your head and leaving it there. You learn of Christ as you take it out of here, into here, and you literally walk it out in your heart. That's when you learn of Christ. This week, guys, let us really just expose our hearts to the Lord. Let's just seek him and inquire of him. Are there areas in my life that I am not trusting you that are preventing me from bringing forth obedience? And know this. And man, some of us, we, some of us, we just got to try this. We never, we never have set out with deliberation to do this. Know this. As you bring forth obedience to God, as you walk it out, as you turn these areas over to the Lord, you're putting off what you need to strip away from your life and you're putting on the mind and the heart of Christ. You are going to walk right into a peace and a purpose and a joy that can only be experienced by giving yourself over to the Lord's program for your life. And man, I'm telling you, you got to give it a shot. you got to be deliberate about it. I want to challenge you this week to set out tomorrow. You get up and, and, and you say, I, darn it, I'm going to be obedient today. I am going to give this a shot. I'm going to try. If you haven't really tried to ever go full in on this deal, you're missing it. Now, i got a long way to go. I'm not Holy Joe, all right? But I have absolutely discovered that the pathway to peace and just a great, great fellowship with God for me has come through the desire to obey. There is nothing better than being in that zone and that communion and that relationship with God when you're trying to obey. Now, you're going to fall. We all sin. You're going to stumble. But God's concerned with this. I'm trying, man. And and there is going to be a peace that you can walk into. If you've never tried to do that, if you've never got up with deliberation and said, I am going to obey today, you're missing it, man. You're missing it. Okay? As you pursue the path of obedience, you are going to experience a greater and greater degree of peace and joy and purpose and hope, okay? And think about this, guys. Think about why this makes sense with me. Think about why this makes sense. There is nothing you will find more satisfying than that which you were created for in the first place. Duh. You will never be more satisfied than when you are walking in what God has designed you for to begin with, okay? So may the Lord give you this week the grace and the strength to walk in in his will for your life, that you would would, would walk with, with a deliberate obedience in your heart that you might experience, if you never have, that peace that the Bible says surpasses all understanding. Philippians 4, 7, let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, thank you that you love us too much to leave us where we are. We thank you that you challenge us. God, we desire to know you. We desire to trust you. Will you show us this week those areas in our lives that 
that maybe we're not fully trusting you with. And God, I just pray that you would challenge each of our hearts to be deliberate about obedience this week so we can just get a taste of that joy and that peace and that that unbroken fellowship with you, God. That's what we want. We, We want unbroken fellowship with you, Lord. We can do nothing apart from your son and his spirit. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. All right.